they believe that we came from the past and the past was the golden age when there was harmony and peace. And so we come from the past into the present to return to the past. So here is the present. From the past into the present to return to the past. And so here I stand and you stand here too having come from the past into the present, and now, uh, at my age, I'm beginning to return now back to the past. That's the view. That's, that's the world view. From the past, into the present, to the past. The past was a time of harmony. We all know that the present is not a time of harmony. There is all kinds of challenges and upheavals, and particularly the evil of witchcraft. Um, is present within our societies, is the African view. So what has gone wrong? They believe, and here's where a meta-narrative comes in, they believe that there has been a break between the past and the present. And that's why things are askew. Things have gone wrong. And within that break, God himself has gone away. So God is not present anymore actively present. And so we, return, we come from the past into the present to return to the past. God used to be with us in the past, but God has gone away, and so we're left on our own devices to try to find the way forward. That's the worldview which permeates African culture. There's many, many meta-narratives that describe this break with the past which has led us into our current dilemma. For example, in West Africa, the uh, tribe known as Akan have this meta-narrative. But this is only one of several hundred. A friend of mine thinks he has counted 600 such meta-narratives across the African continent. This is the meta-narrative among the Akan. A woman in the past, when it was the golden age, is busy pounding out her grain with her mortar and pestle. Mortar is that little round barrel, wooden barrel, and the pestle, the, the, the wooden club that she hits the grain with. It's a time of peace. God is at hand, blessing all that is going on. She gets disgusted because God is so close. So she takes her pestle and she hits God in the face. And whoa, God goes up into the sky. He is furious at what she has done. She's terrified at the calamity. And so she calls all the children, run quickly, find any other uh, mortars that you can, any of these little wooden barrels, and bring them here to me as fast as possible. And so the children run everywhere finding these mortar barrels, and they bring them to the woman. And then they, and so she starts, and then, and so she starts to build this tower of mortars up and up and up and up and up and up so that she can climb to the top of the tower and get God's hand and invite him back down again. She's just terrified what she's done. And so she climbs up this tower of mortars and finally she gets to the top one and she's standing on it and reaching up and she only has this far until she can get God's hand. And she calls to the children, find one more, find one more. And the children race to the village and they find one more. But alas, the one they find is the one at the base of the tower. And so when the children grab that mortar, the whole tower collapses with the woman on top of it. What does that mean? What's it saying? Ah, that meta-narrative is saying that God has gone away and no tower will ever succeed in bringing him back down again. As I say, there's not just one such story. They multiply across the African continent. As far as I know, there is no story anywhere that suggests that this terrible tragedy can be reversed. God's going away is permanent. He will never come back again. He will never come back again. 
So what do we do, says the African worldview? Where do we turn for help? Look at what has happened. God has gone away. Ah, then they get an answer to the question. God has forgotten us, but who will remember us when we die? Our children will remember us. Our children will remember us. Therefore, that's why I said earlier, everyone has to get married because everyone has to have children or you will be lost and go into oblivion forever, you see. And that's why polygamy, that's why multiple wives, as many children as possible. For if the children remember you, then your life will preserved, be preserved in the next life. But if you have no children to remember you, then you go into oblivion <laughs> and your soul, your spirit is lost. Terrible tragedy, terrible calamity. That's the worldview, that's the worldview, okay? Now, so that's what the Zanaki believed. And it's all across the continent, from one end to the other. This is the conviction. God has gone away and he'll never come back again. All right. Now, I told you about that old woman in the church where I grew up when we were there with our grandchildren. Comes into that church, bent over with her arthritis, and she holds up. What does she hold up? You remember? Gospel of Matthew. She holds it up. And she said, this tells all about it. This tells all about it. What did she discover when she read the Gospel of Matthew back there 70 years ago when this first book ever printed in the Zanaki language was made available? What did she read? Ah, she read that Jesus is Emmanuel. First chapter of Matthew. His name is Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. Oh, huge surprise. The God we thought has gone away and will never return again has come. He has come in Jesus. Hallelujah. What a blessing. We thought we're lost. We thought God has gone away. That he's forgotten us. He has not forgotten us. He has come to us in Jesus. It's no wonder across the continent, in church after church, people dance with joy. For the, for the God we thought has gone away has come. He has come in Jesus. He has come in Jesus. That's amazing. You see? And <laughs> more than that, this Jesus, when he is crucified and risen from the dead, he doesn't go back into the realm of the ancestors. He goes into the future and he promises to return again to bring about the fulfillment of his kingdom forever and ever. And the church is that community that believes that and that is formed by that. And so the church becomes a community looking forward to the future when Jesus will come back again. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. You see, so let's say these little circles are churches, congregations. Each one is being drawn forward toward that great day when Jesus returns again. So the churches across the African continent are the communities of the future, the communities which speak of hope, of development, of new possibilities. Why do they believe that? Because Jesus is coming back again someday. And we are, the, we are the beginnings of that coming back again. We talked about this earlier today. That the church is the community of the future. So development work and agricultural development and medical work and all that sort of thing have very much across the continent been inspired by the church, you see. Why? because they're the communities of the future. They're the communities of hope. That this Jesus, who is God with us, he resurrects from the dead, goes into the future, and promises to come back again, and invites all of us to get in the journey with him into that future when his kingdom will be fulfilled forever and ever. So the church is an extremely revolutionary community within the African continent. Extremely revolutionary. As it looks forward to that day when Jesus will come back again. But that coming back again is already happening now in the churches. 
when the churches pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They're praying a prayer committed to development, to spiritual wholeness, to forgiveness of sin, to digging water wells, to doing agricultural work, to building medical clinics. In fact, my mother started the first medical clinic among the Zanaki. And today when you go to Zanaki land, you see this clinic, Alta Bard Shank Medical Clinic, named after my mother, you see. The first, the very first, why'd she do it? because she believed Jesus is coming back again and that he is savior and he wants us to participate in this new life that he brings about now. Very revolutionary movement. And let me surprise you. All of this is to say, how many of you are married, may I ask? How many married? Any of you? Couple, few, okay. All right, all of you singles, this is a word for you singles, okay? A wonderful surprise, you don't have to get married. You can get married if you want to, but you don't have to. You can be single. Because, because children don't give salvation. <laughs> Just imagine the shock all across the continent. Oh. So singleness is an option. In the traditional culture, singleness was not a possibility. Everyone had to get married and have as many children as possible. Why? Because God has gone on a journey. He's not around. When we die, we're going to be lost. Everybody will forget us. But if we have children, then we'll be remembered and our soul will live on after we die. But when Jesus, when the, when the Jesus narrative when Jesus walks across the page of that worldview, what do they discover? Oh, Jesus will remember us. He is resurrected from the dead. He has promised to take us into the eternal heavens with him and participate in his eternal kingdom. So if Jesus has named our name, we don't need children to remember us. It's wonderful to have children, but you don't have to have children to make it into heaven. Jesus is the Savior, not our kids, you see. And you guys, Wonderful good news. You only need one wife if you decide to get married. You don't have to have 10 wives to have enough children that you can have a big, wonderful life in the next life. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You can have one wife and have one or two children or 10 or 20, however many you want, but, you don't, but the children have no connection at all with whether you will find uh, life in the, next li in the next life, you know. So you're free. And so you don't have to have many wives. You can be monogamous. You can have just one wife for 55 years like I have. And no problem at all. That's just simply wonderful, you see. And so the whole worldview begins to get transformed as Jesus walks across the page of that culture.